G'day humans, welcome to the safe space for dangerous ideas and this is the most dangerous and earth shattering and mind boggling idea that any homo sapien could countenance which is, are we just machines? Are we just basically biological machines? Evolved from other animals, subject to the forces of physics and genetics and biology. There is no soul or spirit being injected into our consciousness that gives us the capacity to change what we want or to behave differently than we do. And even more bizarrely, is this actually not just kind of some weird philosophical argument that people in ivory towers and universities believe, but this is where the science takes us. Now, don't dismay. Don't not listen to this conversation because you're afraid that you're going to be sapped of all your willpower and energy and vitality. Um, That will all still be here. This is a great chat with one of the world's leading writers and thinkers about the brain, Robert Sapolsky. He is a huge deal. He's a professor of biology, neurology, the neurological sciences and neurosurgery at Stanford University. You know, so I'm sure he kind of knows what he's talking about. Uh, I first came across Robert with his book, Behave, which is subtitled The Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst. And his new book is Determined, A Science of Life Without Free Will. He is a hardcore disbeliever in free will. It's absolutely fascinating to try to wrestle through all of the implications of that. Uh, And I hope you enjoy as much as I do this conversation with the one and only Robert Sapolsky. I'm well. I am just wondering if I have any choice in being any other way than the way that I am right now. And when we say things like, how are you feeling? Uh, Is there any circumstance under which you could be feeling differently than the way that you're feeling now as you chat to me? No, absolutely not. Um, But opening up a whole can of worms there. Yeah, dig into it. Okay, well, my basic song and dance is uh, there's no free will. Not even, ooh, there's less free will than we used to think, and this may be having ramifications for the criminal justice system or things like that. There's no free will. When you look closely at the biology of how we become who we are and the environment with which the biology interacts, and all of these are things that we had no control over, The result is who you are right now in this moment is the outcome of nothing but stuff that came before that you could not control. And even if in the moment you make a choice where you are conscious of it and you feel like you are an agent doing so and you know you could have done something else and intuitively it feels like the most obvious thing on earth that you're exercising free will in making your choice, acting on your intent, the whole issue is, where did that intent come from? From everything that came before that made you the kind of person who would have that intent at that moment. How certain are we that that's where the intent came from? Well, I'm completely certain. 95% of philosophers, according to most polls, would disagree with me vehemently. And Where would they say the intent came from? They would say intent is certainly influenced by what came before, um, but that there is an element in there of choice which is independent of your past. These are people, the 90, 95% of philosophers who think about this, who are labeled as deterministic compatibilists. They're determinist. They admit the world is made out of like science stuff and atoms and molecules and cells and things, yet... Somehow that is compatible with somewhere in there, there being decision-making processes in us that are free of everything that came before us. And in contrast, I am what would be called a hard incompatibilist, which is once you see how the atoms and molecules and neurons and all of that work, it is completely incompatible with any version of making a choice that is free from 
what made you who you are right now over which you had no control. And is it true to say that the compatibilist thinks that there's intent that's being injected somewhere along the chain? Or is it... Because I I was most familiar with and convinced by Dan Dennett, who's the, probably the chief compatibilist or popularizer of compatibilism, right? Until... Uh, I started reading your book, and uh, <laughs> hopefully you'll get a kick out of out of this because I always like hearing stories about people hearing my podcast or reading my work in weird places. I just landed in Portugal uh, a few months ago, and I was uh, hungover and jet lagged, and uh, <laughs> yeah. and woke <laughs> woke up in this little uh, uh, you know bed and breakfast in Porto, and with this view overlooking the the river, and, and I picked up this book, and I thought, oh god, I've got this huge, big, heavy book about philosophy and psychology to read and it was wonderful i loved it i kept turning the pages and uh, you know ordering more coffee and and reading it it's a, it's a good so it's a good that's a, that's the highest praise i can give robert that i encourage it's a great it's a it's an interesting book and it strikes me that i can follow all of the threads and as you know it's very hard for people to actually land at the conclusion intuitively that you're taking us to because the experience of being alive certainly seems as though I have agency over the things that I do. That's the subjective feeling that I have about my life. Wouldn't the compatibilists say, wouldn't there be compatibilists who would grant you, okay, yeah, we're all, we're just made of stuff. That stuff is arranged in the ways that it's arranged because of the prior history of the universe. Maybe you can throw in some quantum randomness if you want to. Maybe we can get to that or not. Seems like a bit of a red herring, but... <laughs> The, the important thing is that my wishes are being fulfilled. I, I, I choose to order another coffee while I'm reading your book instead of getting up and going out to see the town. You can say I have no free will in making that choice because it's all based on prior things that have happened in the universe. Can't the compatibilist say, well, who cares? That's kind of an academic, like how many fairies are dancing on the head of the pin question. The reality is that my experience is that I, I want to sit here and read the book and order another coffee. That desire is enacted. To say what would the world be like if I could have not wanted the thing that I want and that I'm trapped because I don't want the things that I don't want seems perverse. You know what I mean? Um, it kind of seems self-evident, you know, sort of responding to them on the eggheady academic level, um, you cannot successfully wish for something that you were going to wish for. You cannot will yourself to have more willpower. You cannot think, I am going to think this thing next. These are all domains in which we do not have that power. Our wishes, our intents, our desires, our aversions, etc., are coming from someplace else everything prior, all that sort of thing. But in response to them saying, well, yeah, who cares? This is this academic thing. I could not find any statement in the universe that I would disagree with more because this is exactly what's going on every time you're deciding, should you lock somebody up? They intended to commit that crime. Should you reward somebody? They decided to skip the party and study instead and got a great grade on the exam. Should you? We run the entire world on the notion that the intents we come up with come from out of nowhere. And it's a just world in which you decide we get what we deserve because we're responsible for our intents. And that's simply not the case. Okay, let's, let's deal with dessert here then uh because i think that's a a big one and it's hard to have a conversation about the philosophical minutia of uh a free will before we acknowledge that your broad point right about the sheer contingency and good luck with which those of us who are not suffering terribly or who are not compelled to rape children or who are not compelled to shoot up schools or whatever it is that, that we have a good fortune that we don't want to do those things, right? And yep. we can thank the structures in which we live, the cultures in which we live, the brain in which we were born with, the family into which we were born. Uh, so can we just sort of 
can I just agree with you and concede that <laughs> there is basically a monstrous injustice in ascribing to people far more uh, autonomy than they have. And it's also possible that we are capable of bettering ourselves in some way that seems spooky. And there are ways in which we can <laughs> fall into traps of, of losing ourselves whether that's if you if you've struggled with addiction or if you've gone through periods where you know you've had therapy or you've done some Anthony Robbins course or something and you've had a period in which it certainly feels subjectively like I'm doing something now that is not a direct consequence of the mundane forces that have that have brought me up like there are there seem subjectively to be interjection points in life even once we grant that the school shooter doesn't want to be a school shooter, if I was, if I'd been Hitler, I would have been Hitler, and I would have done the same things that Hitler did. Like I, by definite, it's, it's a tautology, right? Of course, I could, you can't insert my brain and experience into the brains and experience of Hitler. That was Hitler, and he did what he did because he was Hitler. But it still feels to me like that it's a bit cute to use that truth as a way of saying there was never a moment in Hitler's life where there could have been some force of internal will reflection doubt that could have changed his path and that that could have been generated by something that would have felt to him like a subjective epiphany. Sure. Except it can't work that way because at some point... <laughs> Well, <laughs> just so thanks for I'm, pouring cold water on my beautiful soliloquy, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to dissect two of the things you said, uh, to paraphrase, um, I think you said something mm -hmm. like, yeah, we'll admit that there's domains in which we have less choice than we might think, um, but there's this whole issue that we could change. First, no, we have no choice at all is my lunatic fringe argument, not just that we have less free will, we have none at all. Um, and the second taps into what is one of the like reliable things that people panic about when you try to convince them there's no free will. They're saying, oh great, are you saying because everything is determined that nothing can change, we shouldn't bother. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Um, obviously, Change happens enormously in individuals and in societies, you know, wondrous examples, disastrous ones, blah, blah, etc. Um, but where the fallacy comes in is the notion that we sit there and we choose to change. What happens instead is we approach that moment being the person who we are as a result of everything that came before, parentheses over which we had no control, you approach that moment as the person you are, and as a result of that stimulus, whatever it is that's happened, your behavior changes. Let me let me give you an example. Okay, you, you go to the movies, um, and it's like some, I don't know, inspirational movie about some regular everyday guy who does something totally heroic and it's like great and you come out of there saying wow that was so moving that was so it's amazing what one person can do tomorrow morning i'm going to go volunteer to work for the homeless and the person sitting next to you comes out and says wow that was such a great movie the cinematography was amazing First thing tomorrow morning, I'm going to go rent more movies by the cinematographer. And the third person comes out and says, wow, what a piece of crap movie that was so emotionally manipulative and superficial. And first thing tomorrow morning, I'm going to burn all of my CDs made by this director. Okay. In all three cases, your behavior was changed. You changed. You became somebody who the next day was learning about the cinematographer or doing volunteer. You changed. But the question is, why did the three people in this change in such different ways? Because of the people they were coming into it. And the people they were is the end product of everything that came before over which they had no control. Can I... 
So what do you make of the experiences that subjectively feel uncannily like Will? So I'm not talking about, you know, uh, can I choose between a chocolate ice cream or a vanilla ice cream? I'm talking about what you were sort of alluding to when you were talking about people who poo-poo determinism for depriving us of a sense of of capacity and agency and change, right? The, you know, the, the revolutionary is not very inspiring for Braveheart or Nelson Mandela uh, you know, or Martin Luther <laughs> King to stand on the hill and preach to people uh, whatever is going to happen has already been <laughs> decided. We are all but pawns uh, following pre-existing narratives. But go forth and do all of the big, audacious, dangerous things <laughs> that you are programmed like worker ants to have done, my little robots. You know, you want to... There is a subjective experience of like, I was going to do this... Now I've had an experience that directs me to do otherwise. Of course, I didn't choose to have that experience. I didn't choose to be standing listening to Martin Luther King while he was giving that speech. I didn't choose to be the type of person for whom that would land and who would not instead say, oh, this guy's a hypocrite and he's full of it and I'm not going to bother. I didn't choose any of those things. But nonetheless, there's this deep and profound experience of, of now I will do something that I would not otherwise have done. And I'm mustering the capacity and agency to do that. And that, you know, that phenomenon, that kind of subjective phenomenon is not a reason to deny the rigor of your philosophical attack on free will. But A, where does it come from? And B, isn't there a risk that it does get undermined if everybody yeah. believe, you know, doubts free will? Where does it come from? It's generally good for our mental health. A sense of agency is very good. There's a, a literature through the roof showing that psychological stress is built on a sense of a lack of control, lack of predictability. And we thrive in many circumstances, maybe even most circumstances, on a sense of agency. And you could show wonderful sorts of studies that like you make somebody anxious about something experimentally and they will have a sense that the button they're pressing, which is followed a random number of seconds later by a bell or something, they will perceive them having been the agent to make that bell ring more than if you hadn't made them anxious because you look for agency there, you look for control. And given that we're this totally screwed up primate who knows that like at some point your heart is going to stop beating and there's not a damn thing you can do about it, that, that underlying terror makes up a species that really has a very healthy respect for a sense of agency, even if it's not there, even if it's never there. And the best ways to appreciate that or sort of to dissect that are twofold, one is manipulations where somebody does something where they think they are the agent of it. And in fact, they are not because you have done an experimental manipulation. Um, but the other is where there was no manipulation and you very consciously think through and you choose between these two options. And that feels incredibly agentive in that moment. But then you got to say, so where do you get the values from? that made you choose this one, even if that is a moment where you are choosing in the sense that we feel intuitively, why do you wind up being the sort of person who would prefer this choice over that choice? And, and that's, that's where the compatibilist says that that's just asking for too much. You're saying that I should have the choice not to want the things that I want, but the reality is you, it, it, it becomes almost tautological, doesn't it? Of, of course I... Of course, I want to enact the change that I want to enact, and I don't have the choice not to want to. It's like the alcoholic the alcoholic doesn't want not to drink. The alcoholic wants to not want to drink. Yeah. It, right? It's, and we it, all understand it, that, yeah, we all understand that lack of agency, that we don't really get to choose our preferences. I don't get to choose the fact that I like toffee and butterscotch flavors more than I like vanilla and strawberry, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's my experience. But where free will only really matters, surely, is when I'm actually at the ice cream counter or where, when I'm facing an alcoholic beverage, if I'm an alcoholic, and I'm tempted. That's the moment at which 
most people would feel free will becomes relevant. Not the construction of the wants and preferences in the first place, but the ability to either uh, pursue or resist them. Which is absurd. Because <laughs> how did you become that sort of person? Let, let's just take a very realistic example. You go into an ice cream store and all they serve is vanilla or chocolate. And you choose vanilla. You don't want to get chocolate. Why is that? Maybe because the genetic makeup of your gustatory receptors in your tongue so that chocolate tastes like bitter battery acid. Or maybe when you were a kid, you were kidnapped by terrorists who for months on end tortured you but only fed you chocolate ice cream. So now you kind of... Nice terrorists. Oh, if, if, if there is an option, I will take those yes. terrorists. Well, they're terrible the rest Thank of the you. time. Or <laughs> like, yeah, these don't come from nowhere. Like, uh, I, 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 I do these lectures occasionally for judges where they have to have continuing education stuff and teaching them about the brain where my theme is like, you think you're being objective in your decision making, not a chance. You are not exercising free will there. So I, I sort of go through the whole thing. And this one time, this judge afterward, who turns out to be like this major poobah in California, Supreme Court justice thing. He says, okay, th this just doesn't make any sense to me. Like the other week I had this case where it seemed cut and dried. It was this kind of case and I know how I feel about it. And I was going to make this ruling. It was the end of the day. So I was going to make the ruling in the morning. And that night I was sitting there and I said, you know, this particular defendant feels a little bit different from the more typical case. And what's the kind of world from his perspective. It's totally different from mine. And, you know, from his perspective. And I changed my main mind and made a different decision. Are you telling me there was no free will? And I said, like, where in hell did you turn out to be the sort of person who respects reflecting on a decision? How did you turn out to be somebody secure enough that you were willing to say you made a mistake? How did you turn out to be somebody who values celebration enough that you did that that evening instead of just watching a basketball game? How did you? That didn't come from nowhere. Mm. And it's also you, interesting that in that in that judge's example, he's actually giving an example of a scenario in which the conclusion that he arrived at was one in which he uh, granted to the defendant less free will. <laughs> and more yeah. passion, right? Yeah. He didn't flip the other way. He was Ironic like, "Ironic there." I'm, I'm going to give this guy a break or this girl a break. And the reason yeah. why, no, that's exactly the irony there. Um, I mean, the reason why it feels so hard, like you you take an exam today, and like you're really having trouble concentrating, and you can't quite remember the answers, and you get a bad grade and you want to come up with an attribution, a legitimate one that explains why this was out of your control. And the answer is just as you went into the test room, like a large lead, something fell down and mangled your foot and you were being very distracted by that pain that whole time. That one's easy. Most people could say, yes, your free will was constrained in that circumstance because you were bleeding out on the edge of going into shock and in pain and you couldn't remember this you know, equation or what, yeah, that's a case where we can grant free will was constrained or maybe even there was no free will at all. No wonder you got a bad result. That's easy because it's a single cause. It's a dramatic cause. It's a recent one. And it's one that you can understand. Wow. My foot would hurt also. But instead, when we look at somebody who doesn't get quite so great, a uh, grade on an exam, in 99% of the time, it's not because a sledgehammer came down on their foot. It's because of a 10,000 different tiny thinned threads of influences spreading back to when they were a fetus and thereafter. And no single one makes the case, but all of them put together are just as determinative as I can't really concentrate on this test because I'm bleeding all over the floor here. But that one's easy. And and Robert, what do we know about what's actually going on in the brain? And I want to talk about some experiments, you know, where we try to measure the the, sub, the difference between the subjective experience of our decision making and our ability to detect 
you know, electric electrical signals going on in our neurology that that could indicate that we're about to make a decision. I because I think I think most people will be with you so far, right? In the sense that. There are a million different things that are going on all the time in our lives that are leading to the situation that we find ourselves in. We are not agents of our own destiny in the way that our culture tells us we are. If we'd been born poor or with living with a disability or something, we would have a very different fate than the one that we do. So we should all be enormously blessed that we're in the situation that we're in. And the decisions that we make throughout the day are shaped by all of the other things that are going on, the things that have happened but i think where most people who are skeptical of your determinism find their skepticism is in nonetheless once all of those inputs get into my skull something a bit spooky happens <laughs> right and maybe we can talk about religion at some point as well because i think none of these problems really arise for the religious person do they ever right. do you agree like it becomes easy if you're religious then you have a soul the soul is doing oh, the well, decision making simple you don't have, to, don't have to worry about it or if you're i mean we are all we all feel like we're dualists meaning that we all feel i think subjectively like there's a me that is not just the sum of the parts of the meat in my head i don't i don't feel like meat i feel like something spooky so talk about that spookiness and that interface and what we understand about what's actually happening neurologically in the brain as decisions feel like they're being made. Okay. Um, that's great that you were used the word spookiness because that's exactly where I get sarcastic about this all because every single model where somebody admits the world is made out of stuff and there's science, yet, 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 there's still room for free will – Somewhere in their spookiness is the explanation that gets pulled in by the person. I, I very sarcastically early in the book say basically every paper ever written by a compatibilist philosopher who knows anything about the brain could be reduced to three sentences. Sentence number one, wow, neuroscience is finding out all sorts of cool new stuff. Sentence number two, Wow, some of that stuff challenges our very sense of agency and who we are and will force us to rethink everything about praise and blame. Sentence number three, nah, it's actually something spooky that explains all of it. <laughs> and because you read the papers and they're usually incredibly highfalutin and agonizing because it's from a philosopher, but somewhere in there, ah, in those parentheses, that's where the spookiness got brought in there. That's how it happened. And, you know, just dissecting on like that, that ontological level, that's where it comes in. But you could see it in action as well. You could do one of the most amazing things out there, and I had this done to me once. There's this technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Like the scientist puts a probe, a magnetic probe on some part of your head, and it could send out powerful magnetic waves that can get through your skull and go about an inch deep into your brain, which means it could affect things on your cortex. And if they pick the right spot, they can turn the button on and you will bend your finger and you cannot stop it. And you will feel as if not only can't you stop it, but you chose to do that. It's the weirdest thing on earth. Okay. Wait, so do you feel like you chose to do it? Yeah. Yeah. Because I've but, had like, a, I haven't had that, but I've had, you know, you put on one of those, I don't know, a belt that's supposed to get you hard abs by vibrating or something. I can't remember what circumstances I've had. Like some, when an electrical charge is making a muscle have a trigger reflex, and I found it quite unpleasant and disconcerting precisely because it didn't feel like I was choosing it. It felt like my muscle was, spas was spasming. But that's different if you do it directly into the brain? At least it was for me, but I suspect if one looked closely, I was doing a post hoc deal on it in the right. tenth of a second afterward. Wow. But what's so tell Yes, yeah, okay. right. So what about so, the pre hoc ones though, where people have to press a button, you know, when they make a decision? Or, you know, you talk about yeah. bungee jumpers who have stuff strapped to their heads to measure their, mm -hmm. you know, their brains before they make the decision to finally jump. What what do we know about that? Okay, so before before though we switch to that. Um, but staying in the same area, oh, wow, free will, bending your finger, give me a break, let's see something interesting. And one of the most important papers in that field was you put that magnetic probe at a different part of the cortex 
and you could change the moral decisions that people make. You could turn someone into a utilitarian. You could, where you have a question for them, is it okay to kill this one person to save those five and buzz this particular part of the frontal cord? And you get a different moral decision from the person. And the way you do the experiment, right, is of course you're sticking this like distressing probe all over the place. And some of the time you're not passing any magnetic waves. That's your control. So the person who's sitting there saying, oh, whoa, here's this weird thing going on to my head. They don't know which one is actually doing it. So they give their opinion each time. And then you switch the button and suddenly they give a philosophically completely opposite mm. opinion. And you ask them, wow, that seems different from all those other answers you gave. What's different about this case? And they will like tell you about, you know, a manual Kant for the next hour and a half about how that goes. <laughs> no, it's because something out of your control made your brain decide this is what counts as the good moral life instead of that counting as the good moral life. Most of what we're seeing as not only getting a sense of agency, but a structure for why it makes sense is post hoc coming up with like, mm. why, why did I do that? Wonderful work by a guy. In I New mean, York. Yeah, finish that thought. Sorry. Uh, guy in New York university, John Haidt, where he will put people on brain scanners and they're making moral decisions. Is this okay to do or not? And you can see the quote, emotional parts of the brain activate and make a decision, and then your cortex gets told what the decision is, and you, the subject, press this button instead of that one. And afterward, mm. you ask the person, why do you choose that? And they will tell you something about their moral reasoning when that had nothing to do with it. It was an emotional, that alone should be put that to rest okay but what you bring up is let me just pause and tell people yep. before you go there that if they haven't read jonathan height they should uh you can go back and listen to jonathan on this show as well uh, he's he's been on the show and and when he came out to australia and new zealand i i moderated a bunch of events with with jonathan in uh, in australia and, oh, and new zealand so go and go and find those conversations because it is it is fascinating um and uh, just something to add about that electrode changing your philosophical outlook it, it although it sounds weird initially it's not that weird because what is listening to a conversation or having a conversation or listening to a tutor or reading a book other than accreting inputs that are going to change what's going on in your brain right i mean sticking an electrode is just a crude way of doing something that we've all been doing for thousands of years which is trying to persuade other people of things yeah using either language or force or coercion or whatever Perfect. else it might be and where the dualism in most people's minds come in is yeah 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 that was an electrode or yeah yeah caffeine i um, i wake up after caffeine i guess that is a chemical thing or whatever but when someone says something to you that's persuasive that's the me in there that just thought about it. If somebody says something to you that's persuasive, or if they make barking sounds like a porpoise or something, in either case, something is going to change in your brain. Like literally, some ion channel is going to stay open a quarter second longer than it would have otherwise. And most of the time, it's beyond boring. And every now and then, it completely changes who you are. But something in the nuts and bolts of your brain respond when somebody gives you a convincing argument rather than puts a magnetic electrode on your head, it's the same. So, thing. Okay. So, all right, let's, so let's loop back now to some of the experimentation surrounding the experience of free will and what's going on neurologically. Okay. This is, this is, this, this study gives me apoplexy. Like you go and you read any like review paper in philosophy or science mm. about free will and, material basis of it and is guaranteed by the second paragraph this experiment is going to be mentioned this was a guy named benjamin libet university of california san francisco 1983 he did this earth-shaking study where you sit somebody down and you put electrodes all over their head so you can see what parts of their brain are getting excited at what points and there's a button in front of them and you say, don't think about the button, but the second you get a whim to push the button, 
push the button. And we're even going to put up all these electrodes on your arms to see when your muscle begins to contract and all of that. And in addition, here's this gigantic clock in front of you with a two-second sweep. So as soon as you decide to do it, look at the clock so you can tell us exactly when you formed that intent. And what turns out is like you form your intent and about two-tenths of a second later, 200 milliseconds, your muscles start to contract. That makes perfect sense. But what flattened everybody was that there would be this distinctive electrical wave pattern in your motor cortex, the part of your brain telling those muscles to do that. That pattern would appear about 300 milliseconds before you claim you just intended to do that. Your brain knows before you do. Your brain decided and your conscious self is just saying after the fact, ooh, that's when I decided I felt like that. People have been like clawing each other's faces apart at scientific conferences over that. You, There was like a paper two years ago saying something like the title was like Benjamin Libet had his head up his rear or something, or maybe that wasn't quite the title. <laughs> but like for people to get that worked up about a scientific finding 40 years after you publish it, most papers are forgotten within two years or so, showing how much he dominates. And people have been fighting ever since about, is that actually the moment where you intend to do that? Or is that the moment where you became aware that you intended to do that? Is that electrical pattern when you choose to do something? Or is that when you were just getting an urge to do that? And like people and fighting. And, what, and sorry, Robert, what kind of time differences are we talking about in the Libet study between the initiation of uh, a detectable phenomenon yeah. and the subjective experience of choice? Uh, Three tenths of a second. That was with okay. primitive electroencephalography in the 1980s do contemporary brain imaging stuff and other groups have shown you can get five six seconds out beforehand and pick up the the signature of it so like people have built their entire careers and i could not imagine for somebody interested in the free will question something more boring than thinking about that study and all the fights about it because it tells us exactly zero what all of those studies and fistfights are about is when exactly do we form an intent? And when does that occur relative to when this or that happens in your brain, but that and the other thing has not yet happened? And is awareness the same thing as when you for And all of that's about that. And none of it asks the only relevant question there, which is where'd that intent come from? And the metaphor I use is that's like being asked to review a movie where you only see the last three minutes of it. Where did everything that came before, how did you turn out to be somebody who was fortunate enough for reasons completely out of your control that you learned how to read and you didn't have horrible protein malnutrition and there were opportunities and your parents had enough money so you went to university and how do you turn out to be the sort of person who would be interested in psychology and thus take the intro psych class and be the kind of person who would sign up to be a volunteer in this study and somebody who after signing up actually follows through on your commitment and how did you wind up being the sort of person who would sit there and actually sincerely follow their orders instead of being some sort of, you know, contrarian who says, oh, I know they're up to something and I'm smarter than them. I'm going to do exactly the opposite. And why didn't you steal the grad student's laptop on the way out of the lab at the end? How did you become that sort of person? And that's the only relevant question. At that point, who cares if these neurons said something one-tenth of a second before those neurons said something? That's so irrelevant to how do you become that sort of person who would be sitting mm. there with those capabilities and interests and capacity for regulating your impulses and all of that. And there you are. And you actually like generate a data point for these people just as they wanted. I That's mean, I can imagine, question. I, I can imagine a compatibilist granting you all of those antecedent, uh, uh, you know, phenomena and nonetheless still getting into the brain at that microsecond and feeling like there's a need to explain 
why why it why we're doing something before it feels like we're trying to do something you know yeah. why there's an activity in our brain i mean i've always thought those the libet studies are silly anyway even if you do believe in free will because it's entirely possible that just as you know, a few snowflakes are going to gather together into an avalanche before you can see the avalanche. It doesn't mean that the snowflakes aren't part of the avalanche, and you might not notice the avalanche until it's an avalanche. But the initial snowflakes might be detectable by sophisticated machinery that's better than us. Or the same with a wave forming on a beach, right? The, you know, the particles exactly. of water that are doing things that we're not noticing. So it, I don't think it's a... I've never found it really a compelling challenge to free will either in the sense that Maybe the process of making a decision just starts with tiny things that I'm not quite noticing yet. And the point at which I press the button or look at the clock is the point at which my decision making has, has coalesced enough or hardened enough to be noticeable to me. But I don't think it necessarily deprives me of the kind of free will that the compatibilist would want, even if it does start emerging in electrical impulses a split second before I make the choice. Maybe that's just a phenomenon of the way that I make choices. Yep. And what they would seize onto is something you said earlier, where you said the compatibilists would say, I'm going on about, well, what sort of childhood and what sort of genes and what sort of morning breakfast did you have and all of that? And you said compatibilists would say that's asking for too much. Whereas my view is that's the only thing you can ask for. Show me this neuron or this part of the brain or this entire brain that just did whatever it did. And if it would do the exact same thing, if you had somebody else's genome and somebody else's childhood and someone else's fetal environment and somebody else's good night's sleep or terrible sleep and all of that, and show me every single one of those factors, your hormone levels that day, all of those could be changed and that brain was still going to do the same thing. For my money, that brain is showing free will. And you can't show that, and that's not asking for too much because that's all there is. They can't show anything that we recognize as behavior that could occur coming out of your brain independent of the brain's history. Hmm. My, my buddy Sam Harris makes the analogy about the, uh, the shooter who felt there was something wrong with his brain and asked for his brain to be donated to science. Can you remind us of this this incident? And he, it turned out that he had a tumor on his brain. And it reminds me a bit of the way that you start the book, talking about the old line about it being turtles all the way down, you know, the universe, yep. uh, in, in the sense that it, it, it is sort of tumors all the way down. You know, whatever is happening in our brain. So long story short, the guy, the guy turned out, you know, the guy started having homicidal feelings, uh, ended up being, a, a you know, committing a mass murder. Yeah. He was autopsied. It turned out he had a tumor pressing against the part of his brain that was responsible for self-restraint or something. Yeah, exactly. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah, Sam's point is just, yeah, now, we, so we, it's easy to blame the tumor, but remove the tumor and we're all, we all find ourselves in the situation of this guy in the sense that there's something going on in our brain that's causing our desires and, our, and the things that we do. And whether you call it a tumor or you just call it your brain, it's, it doesn't make much difference. We're not authoring the neurological activity that we're experiencing that's forming our subjective uh, experience of life and therefore creating our behavior. So we exactly. all find ourselves in the position of that guy. And he's, he's in implicitly making the same point that I was before. Sam is wonderful. He, we, we are kindred spirits in this zero free will stuff. Um, again, it's easy for us to figure out that why did this person shoot a bunch of people? Oh, it was the brain tumor. Why did this person get a much lower grade on the test than they normally would? Their foot was mangled just before they came in. Those are the easy ones. And Sam is uh, implicitly making that same point that, okay, okay, let's get rid of the cases where it's easy. There's a tumor, there's an injury, whatever. All it is is just so much harder for us to recognize that something as unchangeable and uh, coercive as the tumor was or your mangled foot was could instead be made out of an entire lifetime's worth of tiny little threads that are all put together. That's just so much harder, in part because 
science is only discovering some of those threads and they're in some really unexpected places, but even more so, we got a lot of trouble remembering that like spider webs are stronger than any cable that humans could make per volume and you put a whole bunch of them together and they will be tougher than steel. But it's really hard for mm. us to accept that because they're just these little threads. I'm tempted to talk about retribution and the prison system and how we would reform criminal justice. And I'm sure people will have questions about that, but I actually don't think it's the most interesting a angle uh, of all of this. I think people can read your book if they if they want to know about that. But I mean, can you answer it in like 60 seconds or, or less? Is there a place for retribution in your world? None whatsoever. Um, nor is there any place for blame or punishment. And just as logically, there is no place for praise or reward. Meritocracies make no sense, just as criminal justice systems make no sense, because in both cases, we're treating some people way better than average and other people way worse for reasons they had no control over. But, oh my God, does that mean we're going to have murderers running around on the street? Absolutely not. If a car's brakes don't work and is dangerous and can kill somebody and you can't fix them, you put the car in the garage, but you don't preach to it about how it has a rotten soul or you don't go in every morning with a sledgehammer and bash it on the hood as retribution for the person that it hit back when. You don't moralize about it and you don't do one smidgen more than just making sure it can't get out and be dangerous. And that's the quarantine model that is most like reasonable for thinking about people whose behaviors are dangerous. And we've got a great example of it. There's a circumstance where there's a certain type of human who is dangerous to the people around them. If they are not in some way constrained, they will constitute a danger to innocent people around them. And we have figured out how to handle that without invoking responsibility or free will or retro. If your kid is sneezing a lot, don't send them to kindergarten tomorrow because the rule is if your kid has a nose cold, keep them home because they get the other kids sick. So you keep your kid home. You don't tell them they can't play with their toys because they need some retributive like justice poured on them because they're sneezing. You do the absolute minimum to make them safe. You don't do any more than that. You don't moralize about it. And when you've got the time to catch your breath, you devote research to figuring out where do those colds come from. And that's exactly right. how you would deal with a world of people who are sufficiently damaged that they become damaging. The tricky thing about that analogy, Robert, is that of all of the causes of nose colds, one is not, uh, there, is n there is no way in which the person's beliefs about what is possible for themselves in their life and what is acceptable in the broader culture influences whether or not the nose cold flares up, really. But um, isn't part of our criminal justice system about deterrence as well? And again, let's concede that it's way too barbaric, it's way too punitive, maybe, maybe there's no role for, for punishment per se or retribution. But as all of our brains do their thing and we make decisions about, you know, even if those decisions are, are without our free will about what we're going to do tomorrow, if I live in a culture in which... If someone steals, they get taken into the public square, their hands get chopped off, and people, they get publicly whipped and then burned alive. That's a useful input to stop me from stealing. Except... It may not be a just society, but it's going to reduce the amount of theft, right? Well, just to, just to take a different type of barbarity that I suspect your listeners are not subject to from their federal sort of largesse, but here in the United States where we still put people to death for murders, um, imposing the death penalty in particular states has no effect whatsoever on the frequency of murders of passion, where somebody gets enraged. It has an effect on premeditated murder where you hire somebody and they spend four months like running up a big bill for you before they figure out how to kill your ex Kind of, yeah, it works on that. It doesn't work on other things. Um, you know, our intuitions 
about the effects of retribution can turn out to be very misplaced. But in all of those, like, let, let's go back to this, like, idiotic, like, your kid has a nose cold, protect society from them, but do it without invoking um, punitive judgment or whatever. Culture could come into it. Maybe your kid is from a culture where there are the material means and the privilege for them to have a handkerchief in their pocket. And they have sufficiently sort of cognitively intact that you've been able to teach them when you feel like you're going to sneeze, quick pull out the handkerchief. Maybe instead they're in a different culture where what you do culturally is if you sneeze, you put your right hand up to it and then you wipe off all the mucus with your right hand and you wipe it off on your rump and then you shake somebody's hand. Or you're in a culture where sneezing is a size of Satan, so you pop your eardrums out by holding your nose. And Even something like that is subject to how do you become the sort of person who would carry a handkerchief? Right, but you, yes, one way to become a sort of person who carries a handkerchief to take this to it's ad absurd ad absurdium <laughs> would would be to to beat children who did not uh, blow their noses into handkerchiefs, and that punishment would encourage more children to use handkerchiefs. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to uh, like understand that even if we're mistaken about some of the consequences of deterrence, like uh, the death penalty. I don't think that a disbelief in free will gets us to a place where we're merely treating criminals as broken cars that we don't want to punish, because I think part of the punishment is an attempt to create a climate of deterrence among other people. And without that climate of deterrence, presumably, even if we don't have free will, we're going to commit more, more crimes. Okay. And that's totally legitimate. There's two domains in which... Even if you get rid of the criminal justice system, you can't blame anyone for anything where it still might be a good idea to like beat somebody senseless is if that in and of itself is an effective instrument and in making them less likely to do it in the future. Okay, so that's okay in a circumstance. Sometimes you need to do that. And sometimes it has deterrence value. But then you get into this whole utilitarian thing of is it okay to take somebody who's perfectly innocent, but you're going to burn them and, and, you know, pull their skin off in front of the whole town, and that's going to decrease crime. Is that okay to do? How about if we just put them behind a wall and we do that to them so you can't see it, but you can hear them screaming? How about we put them inside a building and we come out afterward and say, this is what we did, whether or not you actually did it? Is it okay in those? And that's a uh, you know, how utilitarian of a society do you want to have? And what do you do with the fact that people can get a great deal of pleasure from being righteously punitive? And that's like a challenge for making sense of this. Um, but all of that is just in the sense of, is this a tool? Do we want to pretend as if this person has a soul and the soul deserves to be punished? Because that's going to have a good effect on society. That's going to make people help old ladies cross the street more regularly. Okay, is that the kind of society we want or not? That That's, you know, let's all decide on that. But that doesn't actually speak to whether there was free will in whatever you say you're, like, torturing the person for. So let's take the, the positive flip side of punishment, which is encouragement, uh, I guess, and... I remember going to a seminar, to a screenwriting seminar when I was uh, in my late teens or early 20s by Robert McKee, who's this great screenwriting uh, legend, and he gives these weekend seminars. And uh, at one point, he was trying to disabuse all the young aspiring writers of any sense that, oh, I wrote this brilliant thing, and therefore, why don't I get it? You know, why don't I get a screenplay commissioned in Hollywood? Uh, you know, oh, there are lots of bad films getting made. Mine are heaps better than those. And yeah. He was like, only go into this industry if you are going to, you know, write the greatest thing you ever wrote and it will get knocked back a hundred times and you'll pick yourself up and dust yourself off and write another brilliant thing that people are going to shit on and piss on and is going to never see the light of day. And you're going to then be just as enthusiastic about writing yet another thing. <laughs> you know, everyone talks about, oh, Stallone wrote Rocky in five days and then it got made. You know, that's not going to happen. That yes. doesn't happen. That's a, right. This is get real. Be a professional. If you're a professional, you're going to have a hard slog 
it's going to be full of grit and pain and disappointment. And if you can deal with that, then you're a writer. That's all true. And I walked out of that thing thinking, I'm not sure I'm in a headspace that is necessary to pour my love and my guts into writing the screenplay that I love if that's what I'm expecting to happen. And it may be the case that the people who end up going through having that stamina and pursuing their dream that long would not have done so had they not been laboring under an illusion that that first screenplay was going to get sold. Maybe there are some necessary fictions to get us to struggle through this difficult life. And yeah. maybe thinking, you know, in a Pollyanna way that I'm more capable than I am is necessary to get me on the path of grueling success. And I sort of remembered echoes of that when reading your book about, like, maybe there just are fictions pragmatically that I need to believe about my own capability of changing myself and changing the world that are conducive to a, a flourishing life and a flourishing culture and a flourishing society and that the volume on those is turned down by a philosophy like yours. Totally great, valid questions and like a very insightful way of seeing something that supports your point um, is the fact that you ask people to make estimates of how likely this good thing is to happen or that good thing. And people, especially Americans in most of the studies, tend to overestimate the likelihood of a good outcome or pathologically overly optimistic. Or, but you get some people who are totally accurate in it. These are people who are clinically depressed. People with clinical depression are more accurate assessors of the likelihood of some thing happening to someone else. And the soundbite in the field is they're sadder but wiser. Okay, so if you face reality, reality can be pretty awful and you wind up being depressed and all of that. Yeah, and what you've raised is absolutely one of the dangers here. It, a sense that this time, this screenplay is the one that's going to do it. I just know it. This one is good. It's great because I'm pouring my, I've decided, I've chosen to pour myself into this one like no other. Um, you know, that could be a good thing to believe. That could absolutely be helpful in the way that you outline. And just as in an instrumental sense, sometimes it's okay to bop somebody over the head with a big stick to make them less likely to do whatever. Sometimes it's okay to tell somebody this one, this is great, that you just have to finish it. My God, the draft of this to get them to do that. Yeah, that's okay. The key thing is when it does get accepted and you become world famous or whatever as a result, don't decide that you really earned that. Don't decide that you are now a better person than anyone else because you had to show a lot of fortitude to do this. Not only were you not responsible for your writing skills, you are not responsible for the biology of your fortitude either. So, like, the big danger is not that, like, oh, people are going to be deterred from trying because, after all, I have nothing to do with it. It's because they're going to come out feeling entitled or something. And the equivalent is, oh, my God, if there's no free will, you're going to have just people running around murderers all over the place. No, there's a way to constrain that and keep them from being dangerous without teaching them you're a rotten human. The flip side is, oh, my God, if people believe there's no free will, they're just going to pick a random person off the street to take out your brain tumor. And the answer is, no, no, no. We can have a system where only competent people wind up as neurosurgeons, but they, don't, they should not come out the other end feeling as if they are more worthy of a human than other people are. They should not come out the other end thinking that they should be entitled to get the booster, the COVID booster, before like other people do because, well, look at who I am. Like, that's, yeah, hmm. make, make sure they're doing the surgery and not someone incompetent, but don't have them think they're a better person, that they earned that sense. And make sure a dangerous person is not endangering people, but don't have them believe that it was their fault and they're a rotten human. 
And same thing for the person who studies hard, but just because they're not quite smart enough in this domain, they don't get a passing grade. Like they can absolutely understand the nuts and bolts of determinism that made them somebody who turned out that way. And some of the time, it may be a good instrumental stick to tell them if you study harder next time, you may have just like changed their contingency so that they'll do better next time. Right. You can use that as a tool for motivation, but you don't want them to come out the other end thinking, I earned that better score. And thus I am in some manner a more remarkable human. And a more deserving. I'll do you a deal, uh, Robert. I'll do you a deal. If uh, I guarantee that I won't claim to be better than other people if I haul my ass out of bed early tomorrow morning to work out and meditate instead of sleeping in. But I refuse to not feel like I'm a better person than I could otherwise have been. And that, and that I don't get to pat myself on the back for my own grit, even though I know you hate the word grit and devote a whole chapter <laughs> about grit in your book. Nonetheless, I think the fiction has has utility, and I will remain hovering in this uh, spooky, uh, unscientific place about my own subjective <laughs> experience and my own free will. I want to ask you lastly about, and, and this could be, I mean, a whole other hour long conversation, but we'll try to knock it out quickly, just about consciousness and 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 why we have the experiences that we have and why it feels like something to be me even beyond my own freedom. But I want to do that for our premium subscribers. So if you've been listening to the free podcast, thank you. I hope you've enjoyed Robert Sapolsky. You can get the premium uh, edition, uncomfortableconversations.substack.com. Robert, why does it feel like anything to be me in the first place? Why couldn't, from an evolutionary point of view, we just have evolved to be doing the things that we're doing without the lights being on? To hear the rest of this conversation, go to uncomfortableconversations.substack.com slash listen, and you will get your own personal premium podcast feed with at least three extra episodes of the podcast every month and heaps of extra stuff, including the remainder right now of the fabulous conversation you've just been hearing. If it was worth listening to this much of, don't rob yourself of the rest. Pull out your phone right now and search for Uncomfortable Conversations with Substack. 